The listeners of this podcast get a free trial of Audible that comes with a free audiobook. Whether you're stuck in traffic, have long commutes, or want something intellectually stimulating, Audible is right for you. This week, I am recommending one of my favorites. Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and the Quest for a Fantastic Future by Ashley Vance. If you've ever wondered who Elon Musk is and what his path was from humble beginnings through startups and the origins of SpaceX and Tesla, this book covers so much. It was also, in my opinion, done with some great journalistic integrity, and it's my source for understanding where SpaceX comes from and what their goals are because they stem from the man himself. I used to drive three hours a day for work, so I know what it's like to have the commuting grind. My advice is take what seems as wasted time in the car to learn as much as you can. And audiobooks are such a great way to make the best use of your time that you spend in the car. And Audible's perfect for that. So head over to audibletrial.com slash todayinspace to get your free audiobook and start your free trial of Audible on us. Welcome to the podcast. I am your science communicator, Alex Giorfanos, and today in space, we're going to follow up with some orbital news after the successful first launch of the Falcon Heavy. Now, let's dive into this episode because we have a lot to cover. First, I'd like to do a quick launch breakdown for those listening to the podcast. I recommend you pause this and watch this part on our YouTube channel if you can. I have some great footage thanks to my hometown friend Rebecca, who currently works as an engineer for NASA and was able to record the launch from on top of the VAB at Cape Canaveral. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm also splicing the audio from the crowd at the SpaceX launch so that we can capture the energy of the event, which was insane. I I think it's important to capture the human effect of these types of historical launches. So let's get started. The Falcon Heavy launch occurred on February 6, 2018 at around 3.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, after a few delays due to high-level wind shear conditions. Launch director on countdown one, SpaceX, Falcon Heavy, go for launch. Falcon Heavy is configured for flight. T-minus 15, stand by for terminal count. 10, 9, 8, Side booster ignition. 6, 5, 4, When the Falcon Heavy did launch, there was an eruption from the crowd that you thought would never end. Shortly after T plus one minute, the vehicle went supersonic and underwent max Q, which is the maximum dynamic pressure the vehicle experiences as it forces its way through the atmosphere at speeds of 1200 to 1600 kilometers per hour while still accelerating and gaining velocity. At around one minute and 30 seconds, the two side boosters throttled down the engine cut off the second At T plus two minutes and 34 seconds, the two boosters separate. Two boosters then performed the ballet of moves to position themselves back to land. Main engine cutoff and second stage separation occurred at T plus 3 minutes and 12 seconds with second stage ignition shortly after. The fairing separated at T plus 3 minutes and 49 seconds to show the view of Elon Musk's Tesla Roadster with Starman in the front driver's seat, adorned in SpaceX's own astronaut cable. background, you can see the curvature of the Earth and hear David Bowie's Life on Mars playing. With grid fins deployed, the two side boosters and the main core rocket made their way down to Earth. And as you can see on your screen, that re-entry burn for those two side boosters has begun. The 
two side boosters reignited, deployed their landing legs, and safely touched ground simultaneously at 8 minutes and 6 seconds back at Kennedy Space Center, almost exactly as the simulation for SpaceX was showing. And the Falcons have landed! Wow! OZ1, OZ2, both side boosters on touchdown. Although it wasn't shown in the original broadcast, the center core rocket impacted the surface of the ocean at 300 miles per hour, over 100 meters away from the drone ship deployed to catch it. So what did I think of the Falcon Heavy launch? It was amazing. I, I still cannot believe it happened, and I'm, I'm still coming to grips with it. I'm, I'm still putting into words the feelings I had when I saw both Falcon 9 boosters land simultaneously on the launch pad. And even though I don't really know how to explain that feeling or put it into words properly, I know that I want to chase that feeling. You know, if this feeling is anything what it was like when the moon landing happened, or even if it's just a fraction of that, it makes me feel like anything is possible. All of our dreams of space travel can happen if we work hard and smart enough for it. It still amazes me that we ha now have an initially tested rocket technology for Mars. We finally have a rocket that can further be tested and possibly launch humans to Mars with, and, and damn it, we're going! Uh, this is just another boost of momentum behind the Mars movement. Everyone was talking about how that PayPal billionaire guy sent his car into space to Mars, but it wasn't just flair. We, we saw the first test of the world's most powerful rocket system and the success of a reusable spacecraft that launched and landed. I mean, this changes the whole dynamic of the space industry. As SpaceX has a successful record with their Falcon 9s. Out of 29 attempted booster landings, SpaceX has successfully landed 23 of them. Out of 50 Falcon 9 missions, 48 of them have delivered their intended cargo to orbit. But not only that, this Falcon 9 system even supports the most powerful Falcon Heavy, and its reusability drastically cuts the cost of launch for anyone looking to send something into orbit, which in turn means the market for people wanting to launch into space grows. The price of entry drops because flights inherently cost less, and the frequency of flights per month rises thanks to SpaceX, so more people can gain access to space in a given year. In short, it's my opinion that we are seeing the dawn of a new space age, the reusability age. A new way of thinking about how rockets and spacecraft are made that allows for multi-usability to not only launch but also to land, requiring very little rework or repairs apart from refueling to launch again. This extra ability allows us to explore space at a higher frequency than ever before, and now that SpaceX has shown it's possible to build a launch system that's not only efficient but cost-effective. This means space agencies or space companies with any kind of a budget are going to take notice. And it's my opinion and guess that we'll see some major moves in building spacecraft that are reusable, and it will be interesting to see what others come up with. I'm also still finding the words to describe how I felt after seeing Starman and the Tesla Roadster from orbit after the fairings deployed, that view of Earth with David Bowie's life on Mars playing in the background just gave me chills. In a good way. <laughs> that, that song has a completely different meaning to me now that it's forever tied in my mind with the maiden launch of Falcon Heavy. And in case you missed it, there's a tiny version of Starman and Tesla Roadster on the dashboard in case any aliens in the future come upon it a million years later and wonder what it is. Apparently, the Tesla is also playing David Bowie's Space Oddity on a continuous loop, even though in space that you wouldn't be able to hear it. It is actually playing that. The orbit of Tesla and the Starman was originally a heliocentric orbit that was going to use Mars transorbital injection to orbit safely for a few billion years around the solar system. The second stage, however, when it exhausted its fuel to place them in their final orbit, the rocket performed a little too well and pushed Tesla and Starman into a different orbit altogether. You also might have wondered, why send a car into space? I mean, what kind of billionaire nonsense is this? Well, it's more silliness than nonsense. Uh, back in a tweet from Elon Musk, he asked what the silliest thing they could launch into orbit on this mission was. Janet A. Eve, who was also a member of the Space Pan, Space Pan Squad, originally posed the idea on Twitter. I really love the whole display and presentation of Tesla and Starman. It's such a great way to get virtually everyone to put themselves literally in the driver's seat to think about the journey to Mars. You can follow her on Twitter at Janity Eve, that's at J-A-N-E-I-D-Y-E-V-E. -E. A link to her tweet that follows the whole thing will be in the show notes if you'd like to learn more. Now onto the research paper. 
This research paper was timed perfectly and was a great joy to actually see publications come out from this event. I, I see a lot of grandstanding from folks who think SpaceX is all about the show, but it's great to actually see science coming from this, and it got the Space Pan Squad tweeting and sharing some great ideas. The research paper used statistical analysis to find variations in Starman's orbit after the second stage overperformance and came to the conclusion that over the next 1 million years, there is a 6% chance of them impacting Earth and a 2.5% chance of them impacting Venus. Now, a million years is a long time, but a 6% chance of impact is pretty high for me. I mean, granted, with the amount of mass aboard Tesla and Starman and the second stage, there's minimal damage to be done, of course. The angle and speed of them re-entering the atmosphere matters, but um, I'm getting off on a tangent. We're, we're not looking at an Armageddon-esque or direct impact-like damage. We're not even talking about a similar event to the Chelyabinsk in- incident in Russia. Most likely, it will just burn up in the atmosphere. Now, one of the great ideas was that Tesla and Starman could be a future X Prize or something another budding billionaire might decide in a hundred years uh, to send up a retrieval mission to bring it back home and put it in a museum. Now, with a 6% chance of impact over the next million years, I'd say we have a lot of time to plan a mission and go get it. There's a bit of chatter on the internet that's just started that says the only damage SpaceX and Starman and the Tesla will have on the planet is bringing bacteria from Earth to Venus, which is too hot for life from Earth to survive, um, and on Earth it would just be bringing back bacteria. Of course, not every billionaire should be allowed to launch their cars into orbit. I mean, that would be insanity. We would end up having the Tesla ring or the Bugatti ring made up of billionaires' cars ripped to dust and particles from gravity. But this, I, I, this silly idea got me thinking, you know, every SpaceX, every launch by SpaceX and any other entity trying to launch has to get clearance before they do. And SpaceX did, but what does that process look like? You know, is, there, is there a meeting where they all discuss the orbital destinies the payload may take? I'm sure there's some kind of analysis done, but now I'm really obsessed with figuring out what that's like, how in-depth they go, what is it like? Is it similar to what the research paper did or... I don't know. If you have any ideas or know yourself, please share and let us know in the comments below or email me at todayinspacepodcast at gmail.com. Now, one of the great things to take away from this event is that SpaceX proved that in this universe, a reusable three-core rocket can deliver payload a little too well into orbit while recovering two out of three rockets successfully. It's bucked the trend in the space industry and showed that flight heritage isn't everything and you can develop a brand new system that works. It's shown us that new developing systems can be designed and manufactured in-house, be developed rapidly, and then become almost fully reusable as a system. Having SpaceX succeed so well in its first try gives faith to the idea that a Mars colony is possible. It lets us think of ridiculous things like a car being in space, but... And that makes putting astronauts on Mars to live long-term seem a little bit more realistic. I'm just glad we live in the universe that the Falcon Heavy succeeded its mission on the first try. Now, Elon had an original idea to get people to colonize on Mars. And if you go to audibletrial.com slash todayinspace to get your first free audiobook, I recommend Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and The Quest for a Fantastic Future by Ashley Vance. It mentions a time when Elon was trying to fund a mission to Mars with his spoils from selling PayPal. He met with many people in the industry with the knowledge and ability to get to Mars, hoping to fund a mission. One plan would have attempted to send some plants to Mars in a greenhouse. The idea was to send a mission to people that life on Mars was possible. If successful, they would have shown a plant grow from the apparently barren soil of the red planet, potentially inspiring a generation that life is possible on Mars and that they should go. Granted, if they fail, it's not a great look to confirm, yes, Mars is barren and now has actual dead life on the surface. I mean, imagine waking up to a notification on your phone showing a dead flower in the red Martian shoil, soil with the headline, The Red Baron. It's not a great moral, morale booster. But now, here is Elon Musk, how many years later, inspiring us with the world's most powerful rocket, his own Tesla Roadster, and SpaceX's ambassador in the driver's seat. Smartly, they equipped the car with a camera that was live-streamed for a few days. Now, if you had an image to send to Earth to inspire humans to go to Mars, what's better than a view of an astronaut driving a Tesla as Mars comes into view through the dashboard. Now, that's a message. Congratulations, Elon. Congratulations, SpaceX team. And congratulations, human race. We're going to Mars. Meanwhile, back on Earth in the U.S., 
We wait to see what happens with the public sector, aka NASA, as the fate of funding for future projects like the SLS and Orion Capsule are in the midst of budget debates and political bureaucracy. It's very comforting to see SpaceX and Boeing continue their progress on human-rated spacecraft. The Falcon Heavy provides us with the ability to send spacecraft to the moon and Mars. And in this balancing act of space technology abilities, we at least have another human spacecraft being created in the private sector with their aims of bringing back human space travel capabilities. If the ultimate scheme is to make human life interplanetary, said that weird, but interplanetary, then we have a better chance of creating that fantastic future than we have had in the last 20 years. So I feel pretty good about it. And that does it for this episode of Today in Space. Thank you for joining me. You can start your free trial of Audible by going to audibletrials.com slash todayinspace and get your first Audible book for free. Check out Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and A Quest for a Fantastic Future by Ashley Vance for a great listen on what it takes to build multiple companies and have one company launch the other company's car aboard the first company's rocket. And remember, that's audiblebooks.com slash todayinspace for your free trial and free audiobook. Also... Don't forget to check out our merchandise over at Threadless.com. That's right, we have merch. All our shirts are just $18 right now, and we just released our latest t-shirt design, Mars Now and the Tesla and Starman edition. If you like this episode, then you're probably very pro-Mars, but I think we need to go further than that and say Mars Now. And SpaceX has done that by sending a car into space with a Starman in the front seat, listening to David Bowie's Space Oddity on loop. Yes, more of this. So help us spread love and spread science with this Mars Now moment. Enjoy some pretty sweet space gear designed by yours truly and help support the podcast. I'm Alex Giorfanos, your host and science communicator, wishing you a fantastic future. Until the next episode, be well and make sure to spread love and spread science. 